eight years, Alexander the Great had been dragging his Greek and Macedonian troops across the length and breadth of the Persian Empire. But after the eighth year, he crossed the headwaters of the Indus River, and there he finally met the enemy, which defeated him. His troops demanded that they go back home, and so Alexander had to fight a withdrawal back to what was going to be the new capital of his empire, and that was going to be the city of Babylon. But the years of fighting, marching, and riotous living had taken their toll on Alexander, and when he got back to Babylon, he lay on his deathbed. His generals, according to the legend, gathered around him and asked him, to whom goes the empire? And his reply was, to the strongest. And for the next three centuries, his generals and their successors would fight over the carcass of Alexander's great empire. And in these three centuries of warfare, Macedonia was once again reduced to just being a small player in the Balkans. About a century after Alexander the Great died, a young 17-year-old boy named Philip V came to the Macedonian throne. He traced his ancestry rather tenuously and fictitiously back to Alexander the Great, but the young boy king had a problem on his hands, and that was his neighbors. Macedonia was much reduced by this time. To the south, he had hostile Greek cities and leagues. To the west, he had cities and states under Roman protectorate, but Rome was busy being occupied with Hannibal at the time. Across the Aegean, he had Pergamene and Seleucid kings to contend with, but his immediate problem was his northern neighbors. The Thracians were quiet relatively at this time. The Paeonians at one time had been subject to the Macedonians, but in the breakup of Alexander's empire, they had regained their freedom. But the Paeonians weren't the big problem for Philip V. The problem was the Dardanians, because the Dardanians would, almost on an annual basis, invade through Paeonia, going right by the city of Bilizora and the plains it looks over, and raid deep into Macedonia. So Philip decided to put an end to these incursions of the Dardanians, and to that end he struck hard against the Dardanians, but decided to end Paeonian independence, and he seized the city of Bilizora to guard the passes that the Dardanians used to raid Macedonia. His son Perseus had other problems to contend with, and that was basically the Roman army. The Roman Senate was bent on the destruction of Macedonia. And so Philip's son Perseus gathered his troops for the confrontation with Rome, and according to the ancient Roman historian Livy, Perseus told his mercenary troops to go to Bilizora and to prepare for the final confrontation. Well, the final confrontation was that Perseus was defeated, captured, marched in the victory parade back in the city of Rome. Here, the Renaissance fresco depicts him inaccurately as a very old man. But what is known is that the wealth that was taken from Macedonia was incredible. It shocked the Romans who witnessed the victory parade. The province of Macedonia now was no longer free and independent. The kingdom was divided into four parts by the Romans, and our city of Bilizora was in the third district. Now, it is this city, Bilizora, the city of the Paeonians, that we're going to discuss tonight. You're standing on the summit of Bilizora, looking to the east, over the valleys that the Dardanians used to use when they invaded through Paeonia into Macedonia. We know a little bit from ancient literary sources. The ancient Greek historian Polybius said, Philip the king conquered Bilizora, it being the largest city of Paeonia, and lying extremely well placed against the incursions from Dardania into Macedonia. Polybius continues, because of this deed, the conquest of Bilizora, he, Philip, was nearly completely freed of the fear of the Dardanians, for it was not easy for them, the Dardanians, to invade Macedonia, with Philip holding the inroads which ran through the aforementioned city, Bilizora. And so, fortifying this city, Bilizora, Polybius then continues with other battle preparations. Well, where is Bilizora? 
For many years, people thought it was the city of Velez, and magically the word Belezora was supposed to have morphed into the Slavic word Velez, but that's bad linguistics. And then in the 1970s, the man on the left, Ivan Mikulcic, who was very much younger back then, did a walking survey of this entire area, and he said, well, there is a small pre-Roman settlement at Velez, but this is supposed to be the biggest city of Paonia. And he said there is a site near the town of Sveti Nikolai that is six times larger than the site that everybody thinks is really Bilizora. So he said, why not excavate here? And the site is on top of the small plateau you see in the background. Well, in the 1970s and 80s, he and his wife dug a few trial trenches at Bilizora, and they found ruins there of a substantial fortification. Eventually these trenches were backfilled. And it is here now where we started digging six years ago. The city of Bilizora, the largest city of the Paeonians. Now if you want to place Bilizora and the Paeonians on a modern day map, we're going to zero in on this area of the Balkans. Highlighted in red used to be Yugoslavia. And of course Yugoslavia was made up of various republics and autonomous regions. When Yugoslavia broke up in the 80s and 90s, these all gained their independence. Many, of course, did not recognize the independence of Kosovo, and many countries refused to call the Republic of Macedonia the Republic of Macedonia, preferring instead the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. But let's get the contentious nationalistic names off the map. These are the major cities which now exist in this region, and our city, Bilizora, is there. It is Homer in the Iliad who first mentions in ancient Greek literature the Paeonians. And he mentions three leaders of the Paeonians who led their troops to fight against the Greeks on the side of the Trojans during the Trojan War. And Homer describes how all the great Paeonian leaders are essentially killed off by Achilles and the other Greek warriors. But when Homer mentions the Paeonians, he always locates them on the Axius River. The Axius River is this river you're looking at. It's what the ancient and modern Greeks call the Axius and what the Turks and the modern Slavic people call the Vardar River. And if we go back to our map, this is the watershed of the Axius Vardar Basin. Now, 400 years after the Trojan War, the Paeonians are still living along that river, but at the same time, around 800 BC, tribes of Macedonians are moving out of the mountains of northern Greece down towards the seashore. In the middle of the 6th century, the Paeonians are at their greatest peak of power, but the Macedonians are starting to build a small kingdom. Now, it doesn't take a prophet to see what's going to happen here. Eventually, the two peoples are going to come in contact with each other, hostile contact. But oddly enough, as the Macedonian kingdom expands and they conquer more and more Paeonian land, they do not exterminate the Paeonians and they do not expel the Paeonians. Rather, they absorb them into the Macedonian kingdom, and the Paeonians become one of the largest ethnic minorities in ancient Macedonia. But they are one of only many tribes surrounding the growing Macedonian kingdom. By the time of Alexander's father, Philip II, most of Paeonia is under Macedonian control, and during the time of Alexander the Great, all of Paeonia is controlled by the Macedonians. And if you read the account of Alexander's campaigns, he uses the Paeonian cavalry as some of his crack troops when fighting against the Persians. But in his great empire, the Paeonians were only a very small part of that empire. When the empire broke up, the Paeonians were probably still subservient to the Macedonians, but by the time of Philip, they had obviously gotten their independence and it is Philip who ends their independence once again in an attempt to secure his northern border. Now the site we're going to look at is located in a region the locals called the Ofche Pole, the sheep field. And it is a very good place for grazing sheep, cattle, horses. It's a very fertile district. As we mentioned already, the Mikulchiches in the 70s and 80s did a few trial trenches there. 
When we got there six years ago, the local archaeologist erroneously told us that a dip in the top of the hill was a natural dip. But when we hired some of the local workmen, they had another story. They said that that dip was actually dug by the Yugoslavian army in the 1980s when they used Bilizora for their war exercises. So we decided to put their story to the test. And sure enough, just a few centimeters beneath the topsoil, this great stretch of obviously man-made structure appeared. And then as we cleared more away, well, we found cartridges from the Yugoslavian army. And then the question, why is this guy smiling? We found the food tins of the Yugoslavian army. So in fact, they had hit the ruins of Bilizora. Now in the 1990s, Bulldozers attacked the site. They were looking for road base material to build roads. They dug into the northern side of the hill, just ripping things apart. And as they were doing so, they came across a large pool. Now, they excavated it, but when we got there, as you can see, it had grown over again. They published it first as a cistern or a water reservoir. But as we cleaned it up and began working on it, one of our graduate students, or actually was an undergraduate student at the time, said that this isn't a cistern, this isn't a reservoir. First of all, there was no bottom to it. There was no floor, so that doesn't hold water very well. And then he said, look at the orientation. It's not north, south, or east, west. It's pointed 302 degrees, which is exactly where the sun sets on the summer solstice. And so his idea was, this is no cistern, this is some sort of ceremonial pool that they had built at the foot of Bilizora. And then we got there six years ago. We decided to start digging at the highest point on the Acropolis, because that's where all the treasure was going to be. So we laid down our trenches, we began scraping at the ground, and we found absolutely nothing in the first few trenches we dug. Well, I shouldn't say that. We did find something. At the bottom of this trench, two meters down, we found a food tin from the Yugoslavian army. So what it obviously it was to us, they had rearranged the terrain of the hill somewhat. So we went back to the Mikulcic's old trenches, which were easy to locate, despite the fact they were backfield. We opened them up, expanded them, began digging on both sides of a very large wall. The findings were good. Uh, there was a great deal of pottery was unearthed. Some large storage vessels were unearthed. And after about a month of very productive digging, we had found a large plaster floor, part of the Acropolis defensive wall. We thought in the lower left-hand side we had the curb stones of a street. It was interesting, nothing to really knock your socks off about, but we were happy at least we weren't finding Yugoslavian army tins anymore. But what we didn't notice on the night of July the 3rd was the cloud situation. Actually, we did notice it was very pretty and everybody took pictures of it. And as we sat down to dinner at 8 o'clock, there was a thunderclap which made everybody jump up out of their chairs. And for the next four hours, there was a torrential downpour. And we knew we were not going to work the next day. And when the rains finally stopped, we went out and all our trenches had been turned into muddy swimming holes. This is the ceremonial pool, completely filled up with mud after we had just cleaned it out. So we had to wait until everything was dried out. We did eventually get back to the sites, and then the surprise hit. What we thought were a few little curb stones were actually raised stones in the middle of a very long ramp leading up through the defensive wall of the Acropolis. Now, here we're looking at the bottom, looking up this ramp, what this is, we eventually figured out, was a propylon, a monumental gateway leading into the Acropolis. Let me show you what we have here. First, we have the Acropolis defensive wall. Then we have a square foundation of a very small ceremonial tower that hits, as you can see, right up to the beginning of the ramp. Then we have a large wall that flanks the ramp in later years, we found more of it and the foundation of a never ceremonial tower on the opposite side, and then raised stones with sockets in the middle. And so the way we reconstructed this is as a propylon, ceremonial towers, an inclined ramp, an internal gateway, and a rectangular room. The reconstruction of it 
looks something like this. A small, permanently burning altar at the entrance, which is common in ancient cities. The small ceremonial towers, you go up the ramp to the gate, you come into the rectangular room, and then out to something. The big question was, what does this monumental gateway look on to? Obviously, you just don't build something monumental like this, and it doesn't open on to anything. So the next question is to find out what lay beyond the propylon. So as you can see, we began digging off on either side of the propylon, hoping to find something. Well, that's not quite honest. It was not something we were hoping to find. We were hoping to find a temple behind all of this. And there were some very good finds. Now, you can see by the faces of the people who are smiling, they already know what's coming up out of the ground. And the girl, the woman who is clearing this stone off, this was her first dig, her first day, the first hour of her first day on a dig, and she makes this find. For the next few years, she was not going to find anything. But she started off with a great find, and what it was was a triglyph and metope fragment from a Doric order building, the kind of thing you would see on a temple facade. But as you can see here, it's reused in a wall. So obviously it must have fallen from a nearby monumental building. The question is now, where is that monumental building? We kept digging and expanding our trenches. Uh, we found an inscription in Greek letters, and one of the graduate students working with us for a few years deciphered it in a strange dialect of Greek or Paeonian, he thinks, saying something about the sacred mountain. But it's so fragmentary that you can't make much more out of it than that. We found a great deal of pottery, drinking vessels. Uh, you see the centimeter stick there. These are huge vessels that you pick up with both hands when you drink, which may explain why the Paeonians didn't too, do too well against the Macedonians and Dardanians. Miniature vessels. Lots of Greek words scratched into pottery, most of it imported from Athens. Little figurines, primarily bird and cow figurines. Fibula, bronze brooch. Miniature bronze vessel. Some weapons every now and then. But what we were really looking for was the building that the propylon opened up to. So for three years, we systematically did trial trenches to find, to find out what you went through the propylon and looked at when you got out of it. Well, three years was frustrating. We weren't finding anything, so we called in the heavy guns. Uh, we knew that under 20 centimeters of soil, the ancient ruins would begin. So we had the bulldozer dig down 18 centimeters, then we dug by hand, but we found nothing. Then we dug by hand a little bit more, found tops, uh, virgin soil at that point. And so, as you can see in the dirt on to the right, there's no artifacts there. And this was most peculiar. We kept telling him to dig for more and more, further and further, still in line with the propylon, and just sterile earth was coming up. So we figured in the center of the Acropolis is a very large open area. But what was the propylon looking at? Now, the tree you see in the background is where the old Yugoslavian army trench is located. And as the bulldozer was approaching that, finally it hit some rocks. So we called him off, we got everybody together, began scraping away the dirt, and we saw immediately that these are stones, again, from a classical Doric order building. And we expanded our trenches now and began finding column parts, capitals. We did some very detailed work around these stones and something odd was noticed. Somebody pointed out that these stones did not just fall off a building. That the larger stones were intentionally chopped up and thrown into a great big pile. And then as we began digging more and more around the stones, we began finding fragments of human skulls three altogether, and some animal skulls, some long bones, but no, no skeletons, no articulated skeletons, just miscellaneous bones thrown into the same pile as the stones along with some pottery. 
Then we noticed that there was a great deal of burning evidence around this pile of stones. The big stone on the right is a crazed and cracked stone that has suffered from intense heat. And you can see some of the burned bricks right next to it. So what eventually dawned on us was these stones just didn't fall down. People had brought them there after they chopped them up and they were going to burn them down into lime mortar. And in fact, we found fragments of lime mortar everywhere in this area. But then the surprise came when we looked at this stone and began to measure it. It's a very unusual stone. You see the flutes of the classical column, but remember in a Doric order building, there is no base to the column. But you see a little ring at the very bottom where those flutes turn into facets. Let's go to Athens for a minute. This is the Stoa of Attalus. It's been rebuilt by the American School of Athens, and you'll notice that the lowest columns are not fluted. They're not grooved. They have these facets. The obvious reason is you lounge about in a stoa. And who wants to lean against a column with a sharp groove pointing in their back? So the lower parts of the stones are all smoothed down into facets, but it's the stone right above it where the flutes, the grooves, turn into those facets. And that's exactly the kind of stone we found at Villa Zora. And this renovation, or this innovation, I should say, in Greek architecture started in the time of King Philip V of Macedonia. So we figure we may have a stoa of Philip's up at Villa Zora. And if we construct a simple stoa, these are the stones we found in that one square. So we expanded our trenches somewhat from the pile of stones, came down across a very substantial large wall, opened a trench in front of it, kept going down further. The wall was quite large, three meters across, and at about two meters down, you can see stones projecting out. This is the splashboard, the stones that keep the water during a rains from undermining the foundation of the trench. It's also the beginning of the subterranean foundation courses. But in that year, we never got to the bottom of it. We found an edge to the wall, kept digging deeper, but again, never found the bottom of the wall there. But we were able now to hook up our section of wall with the stones of the old Yugoslavian army trench. What the Yugoslav army had hit in the 80s was a portion of the western necropolis city wall. So at the end of 2010, this is what we had. We had a city wall, the portions of a stoa, some places where stones had obviously been robbed away. And here, in highlighted in yellow, we have the 17 Doric Order stones that were thrown into a heap. The next year we dug in other areas of the hill, just to open up more trenches, and with three days left to go in the excavation, these four disreputable looking individuals finished their trench, and they said, can we go back to the old area and finish a trench we didn't finish the other year? So we said, why not? So they started digging down, and you can see a little projecting stone at the bottom. As they began cleaning around this stone, they called us over because it was a bit unusual. As they went down, these were very finely cut stones. Well cut, finely cut, pressed close together, well cut ashlar stones, not like other stones we had found in the buildings of Bilizora. So now, with two days left to go in the dig, we called in as many workmen and students and teachers as we could to put them there to see what we were digging. And after two days, we found two walls built of very well-dressed stones meeting together at a peculiar 105 degree angle. And in classical architecture, nearly everything is always at a 90 degree angle. So we didn't know exactly what we had here. So at the end of 2.10, this is what we had. At the end of 2.11, we have the corner of some building. Now, we knew in 2012 where we were going to start digging. We opened up more trenches to see how far this wall was going to go, and it kept going and going and going. This is going to be the wall of the palace of King Philip V. As we began expanding our trenches on either side of the wall, we found more column fragments. By the end of 2012, 
Still following the wall, we had a portion of a circular room. This is what is marked as, as the tholos on the diagrams you have. And finally, the wall stopped. We dug down, found a threshold block. And so there, at the end of the 2012 season, we have the outer wall of the palace, part of the circular room. If we look on the diagram, this is what it was like in 2011. In 2012, we had this. And then in 2013, we had that. We are digging in the corner of the palace of Philip V. Let's start with the room we call the kitchen. After topsoil, we found a large layer of roof tiles, and under the roof tiles, some charred timbers, obviously from the roof. In fact, the timbers were quite large and well-preserved. You see this one about 12 feet long. And by analysis, we found out these were conifers, which do not grow in that region anymore, by the way. We began finding pottery of the 3rd and 2nd century BC, fish plates. We found a grinding stone, an amphora neck, a wine storage vessel neck. And we found quite a few wine storage vessels, as would be common in an ancient Greek or Macedonian kitchen. A few small pots that were preserved well. Only the smallest pieces were well preserved. All the larger things were completely shattered. And here again, another very unique type of amphora. It's the number B on this diagram, which was popular in the 3rd and 2nd centuries B.C. As we began cleaning in this kitchen area, you'll notice that this guy is cleaning what appears to be a white streak growing, going through the trench. But as we cleaned down, that white streak he was clearing was a line of plaster. The plaster which lined the wall of the kitchen. But you see, the wall is gone, except for a few stones in the lower part of it, because after the Romans conquered Bilizora, they systematically looted the stones of Bilizora to carry them off to use someplace else. So we have now only the shadows of the walls inside the kitchen itself. But by following the plaster tracings, we were able to outline these internal walls of the kitchen. We finally, tracing these plaster streaks, came across a large, well-preserved stone. We finally thought we had hit a good stretch of preserved wall. But as we began cleaning more of it, it turned out to be another one of these threshold stones. But again, this one's cracked. So we thought they were probably trying to lift it out of position, haul it off. It broke as they were doing it, and so they left. Here's a section in the kitchen of a large terracotta surface you can see there is a circle going around it. This was a baking surface, which they used to make open fires to cook some of their foodstuffs. We found a number of strange items. This thing had nine little volcanoes in it. Uh, the holes didn't go all the way through. We can't, to this day, we don't know what it was used for. So we cleaned it up stuck some weed in it and decided it's of religious significance. This is what people use to make offerings to Demeter, the goddess of grain. Actually, we have no idea what the thing is. Found a small bracelet, probably a child's bracelet. When we first dug it up in the ashes of the kitchen, we thought it was bronze, but after cleaning it up, it turned out to be a silver bracelet with two snake heads on it. And of course, there was a great deal of plaster to be found everywhere. White plaster, red, black. The black plaster, as you can see, is stippled. Sometimes it's painted with little roses, we think. And occasionally swirls or waves of some sort painted on the plaster. That was the kitchen. The next room over opened into the internal courtyard. We just called it the anteroom to the tholos, for lack of a more imaginative term. Again, we found columns capitals of the Doric order, but these were not of the same size as the other ones we had found the other year. These were larger, and they were probably in the internal courtyard that gave way to these rooms of the palace. And so from the anteroom we go to the tholos. Now a tholos in classical Greek architecture is simply a round structure. It was used oftentimes as a ceremonial banquet hall, Sometimes it was used for strictly religious purposes. 
Sometimes it was used as a throne room. Other Macedonian palaces have similar types of round rooms in them, just like this. But you notice it's unlike most of Tholoi in ancient Greece, it's not freestanding. It's some, uh, built within a square, probably to make the roofing of it easier. Well, as we got towards the Tholos, we noticed that, again, the walls were destroyed. There was some burnt mud brick charcoal. Apparently, they robbed out the good stones of the lintel, the threshold, and when the thing burned down, the lintel timbers up atop just fell straight flat on the ground, but they were easy enough to trace in the ground. We cleared off the tiles and exposed a surface within the round room. And here, as you can see, we have not cleared it completely. We're still leaving a good section of the round room for another year, for another generation of archaeologists to excavate. Interesting pottery came out of the round room. This is a fragment of a column crater. But what's interesting about it is on the top, there are stamps into the clay. Now, what these stamps are is unknown. On the handle itself is this bizarre shape, and all of us looked at it and couldn't figure out what it was, and somebody said, well, it looks like a menorah. And I said, well, yeah, it does look like a menorah. So jokingly, we called it the menorah of Bilizora, but obviously the Paeonians didn't use menorahs in any of their worship. The other little round stamps have some sort of strange snake-like symbol on it, but... Nobody who has dug there that year has ever been able to come up with an explanation of what exactly it is. Now, also in the 2012 season, just outside the palace wall, right along the side of the trench where we could barely squeeze in, we found two very well-carved stones, which at first we thought were small ceremonial altars of some sort. And they were sitting on a step, as you can see. When we dug on the other side of the stones, we noticed... Well, it's not just one step. There are five steps going down. So we had in our minds that here near the entrance, as we knew the entrance was, we have a small little platform where maybe one or two little dedicatory offering altars are there. But look at the stones at the very bottom. You can barely make out a circle inscribed in the top of each of them. Well, we started clearing the dirt away from the sides and saw what we now know to be the beginnings of unfinished Corinthian capitals. We would eventually <clears throat> free them from the dirt around them, and there were two capitals. In both of them, of course, there are four faces. So we have eight faces now that we looked at, and as we spun these around to look at them, we saw that some were just barely roughed out. And here again, the diagram that you have before you. You can follow this and that. Here you see the acanthus leaves at the bottom are starting to be carved clean. The volutes, the circles on the side, are still pretty roughed out. On this side, we have the acanthus leaves beautifully done. The flower on the floor, flower in the center is well done. The volutes are still unfinished. But on this side, you can see the volute is finished. The acanthus leaves are finished. The flower in the center is just about done. But as we began cleaning even closer to the details of the capital, an interesting discovery was made. That in one of the canthus leaves there was a slot cut out. We couldn't figure out what the slot was for. But then as the cleaning went on, we noticed, look at the canthus leaf right next to it. If you look closely, you can see it's an independent piece of stone that has been jammed into the slot. Now, in the Corinthian capital, there's all sorts of frills and foliage and whatnot, and it's very easy, as you're carving, to chip something off. But what do you do when you mess up your capital? You don't go and start a whole new capital. You carve out the piece that was chipped off, make a little slot, carve a new piece, and then stick the new piece in, secure it with mud and mortar. So we saw not only the process of carving, these various Corinthian capitals. We saw the process of how they fixed their mistakes as well. So the question was now, what are our two little altars there? What are we going to do with these? Well, at the beginning of this last summer, we decided we were going to open up the area all to the right of this trench. And there, as you can see, immediately, those two little stones are not two little stones at all. One of them is quite long. And as we began clearing the step, 
the step they were resting on spread all the way across the entire trench. And we began finding more column fragments. And when we got it cleaned up at the end of the season, we found the five large steps and all sorts of fragments of a Corinthian order building crashed and scattered on the steps. This is, on the diagram, the vestibule we're talking about. And as we picked these stones up, we began seeing every single stone that was necessary to recreate a facade of the Corinthian order. This is the cornerstone these two are cleaning. And if you look, this is the part you would see as you walk into the building and you look straight up in the air. This is, would be the overhang that you're looking up into. But if you look very closely, you can see the remains of paint on them. Now, for years in lecturing on Greek architecture, we always knew that the Greeks painted their buildings. We know from literary sources. But none of us had ever seen personally a stone with the paint still on it like that. And here we have the plaster work painted. We found both red and black plaster on these dentals, the teeth parts of the cornice, and of course which would have made very good play of light and shade in the overhang. But it is from all these stones now that we can recreate what this vestibule facade looked like on the palace. And we're going to do it in a schematic way. We're going to have a 3D recreation here. We're clearing the 3D recreation of everything except the monumental stairway and the foundations of the buildings. We've cleared off all the stones. But going back to these stones now, we can recreate the entire facade from the bottom to the top. And we're going to start with those two stones in either corner. These stones are the plinth and the base for a pillar. Now they are, as you can see in the drawings, not the same. The plinth, the square part, is the same in both, but the bases, for some reasons, are carved differently from one another. The one on the left is very badly preserved, as you can tell. The one on the right is better preserved. It is odd that in a facade you would have stones not like one another flanking it like that. And moreover, since they were both resting against walls, you would have suspected they would have carved them straight to rest neatly against the walls, but they didn't for whatever reason. So we have the two bases of the pillars for either side of the monumental stairway. This stone now, actually two, three stones now, is the pillar itself. And it fits directly on top of the base to the right. And in fact, when we measured it and drew it, we noticed that it tapered slightly, but the measurements were perfect. It fit neatly on the base down below. So with that bit of information, we go back to our schematic and we put up the pillars, okay, leaving out the frills of the base work. We have two pillars standing up now. We know that they are four and a half meters tall from the step up to the very top. Now, since we know they're four and a half meters tall, that means we can raise all of the walls up to that height. And so in our schematic, we bring all the walls up to the top of the pillar level. Then we have another plinth square base. There's actually another one here. We could tell by the marks on the step. This is where we begin recreating the column. Okay, the Corinthian column rests on a plinth. The next part is the rounded base. Now, we didn't see any on the proper position, but we found a half dozen fragments of rounded stones, which obviously had to come from the base. But we found the columns for both plinth. So leaving the base as somewhat theoretical, we can build up the columns now. So we bring the columns up to the height of the plinth. From the other stones, we can begin building the entablature, the architrave, the frieze, and then the cornice block with those dentals on it that we had looked at. We have, in fact, all the stones necessary for the Corinthian entablature. So we put the entablature on top and then we roof it all over. And that gives us a rough idea of the height and look of our monumental stairway and vestibule into the palace. Now notice we didn't talk about the capitals. The capitals are not those two capitals that were unfinished. Those were never on top of the columns. We think the sculptors working on them were looking up at the capitals on the columns, using them as models to sculpt their columns. But in the mess of all these stones on the steps, 
we did find fragments of Corinthian capitals that were in fact finished. And by looking at the unfinished ones, we can relate them to their proper position in the Corinthian capital. So in fact, we do have not two complete Corinthian capitals, but enough evidence to tell us that there were at least two finished Corinthian capitals there. We have come up through the outer courtyard, up the monumental stairway into the vestibule, then we enter into the palace proper through the entrance hall. Okay, that's the entrance hall at the back end of the photograph. There is again another threshold block. These threshold blocks are peculiar to 3rd and 2nd century BC Hellenic architecture. Now, the vestibule is at the top, the entrance way is at the bottom. One would assume we're walking onto a beaten earth floor, which was not unusual in many palaces. But just to be safe, we put down a trial trench and found that number one was the block we had uncovered, but there was a lower part of that same block, number two. Foundation stone for that, number three. But against the wall, there was a piece of painted red plaster. Now, at the bottom of the red plaster, that's where the floor was. And it was a beaten earth floor. But with the knowledge that the walls of the room were going to be plastered, we carefully started carving some of the mud away from the walls. Found, again, red and black plaster. In the corner, a large water jar. After all, you're coming in to the palace, you want to wash your hands off before you proceed further. But you can see how very well preserved the bright red plaster was in this building. We found 5th century B.C. pottery on the floor of the entrance hall. We found some local made 3rd century B.C. pottery on the same floor. And then we enter from the entrance hall into the inner courtyard of the palace. And as you can see, we've only excavated a little section of that. Again, the threshold block of the palace leading out into the courtyard where you see a great deal of burned soil. But again, we found that the walls of the inner courtyard of the palace were again well plastered. But look where the arrows are. Between the stones of the wall and the plaster, there's about three inches of clay, mud, and mortar all slopped together. It's dried out, then they put a fine layer of plaster on it, and then they paint it. So this is the beginning of our excavation of the palace of Philip V. We know that Philip V started it when he fortified Bilizora. He built for himself a residence and a garrison post here. But the palace was also used by his son Perseus. This is where he sent his mercenary troops in his fight against the Romans. But we also know the palace was never finished before the Romans destroyed the freedom of Macedonia. We know this by the two unfinished Corinthian capitals that were there. They were obviously working on them before they were pushed aside. Where in the palace they were going to go, we have no idea. In the anteroom to the palace, you see up against the stones two layers of rough plaster that have been scored. Obviously, they were being made ready for the final layer of fine plaster that was going to be painted. And you can see on the steps, some of the stones of the palace wall, particularly the upper ones, were never smoothed out. They were still left rough. This, of course, would have been the last job of the stonemasons, is to smooth the stones out. So the palace was never finished when the Romans conquered Macedonia in 168 BC. But on the steps, doing some soundings by the bottom of the steps, we found something interesting. Now, you have to imagine dirt over this entire little square trench. You have to one side the palace wall and then two foundation courses. You have the lowest three steps of the five steps. But I draw your attention to this stone which, as you can see, is cracked in half. We think this was intended to be the first course of steps. You see there's a stone right beside it. And then when they put the second course of stones on top, it cracked. Now why? Well, on the right-hand side, the stone is resting on a solid stone foundation. The rest of the stone is resting on dirt. So there's not an even support underneath, and when they put on top the heavy stone, it cracked. 
Well, probably the last thing the king wants to see in his monumental stairway is a cracked stairway going up. So the architects had to quickly think of something else to do. And so they decided they were going to take that second stone, which may have also cracked, take it and chop it up into four blocks and make a solid stone foundation that all the stones of the new stairway can be built on. And then as far as the rest of the stuff, they covered it up with dirt so it was no longer visible. There is the corner of our palace. Now, we can kind of fill out the palace. We have the ground plans of the Macedonian palaces at Pella, Aigai, and Demetrius. And three of those palaces look very similar to the one we're excavating right now. Now, we can square off the vestibule. That's not hard. But in the vestibule, there is a doorway. So that means that the vestibule is going to be a little bit larger than we might think of. We know that most Macedonian palaces were built in a rectangle or a squarish pattern. So we could add on to the kitchen another wing. Now, of course, the wing is going to run into the city wall, and unfortunately right there is the Yugoslavian army trench. So the damage is done. We'll never know how the wing and the wall integrated with one another. But if the Bilizora Palace follows the Igai Palace and the Demetrius Palace, we can postulate a rectangular set of rooms around a large open courtyard, in the middle of which will be a system. So that's the portion we have gotten to so far. To reiterate just briefly, in 217 BC, Philip V conquers and fortifies Bilizora with his palace, his garrison post. His son Perseus, we know from Roman sources, sent his mercenary soldiers there to get ready for the war against Rome. But in 168, Rome defeats Macedonia. So what happened to the palace? Well, the other Macedonian palaces at Aigai and Pella were destroyed by the Romans. The palace at Demetrius was not. And the Roman commanders made the conscious decision to dismantle the Demetrius palace. And they may have done the same thing here at Bilizora. Dismantle the palace, take the stones away, eliminate it as a point of future resistance to Roman rule. Now, we are writing up the work on the palace of Bilizora. Our first is going to be three volumes. The first volume is already out. You can find it on Amazon.com. Uh, we talk about the chronology, the various parts of the Acropolis of Bilizora. There is a large article on the Propylon, how it was constructed, how we arrived at this reconstruction of it. There is also a detailed analysis of the sacred pool of Bilizora. And there is a great large section on something I didn't get to talk about tonight, and that is the International Field School we've been running now for seven years. This is where we bring archaeologists, professors, teachers, graduate students, undergraduate students, volunteers from all parts of the earth together to work here at Bilizora, everybody teaching each other their specialty. And so far we've had, I think, something like 190 some odd people from 14, 15, or 16 different countries working on the Bilizora project. Volume 2 is, we're working on it right now, we hope to have it out by the end of October. It will cover the pottery of Bilizora. It will be analysis and description of the typology of the ceramics, some of the larger pieces, some of the smaller pieces, even the ones with little graffiti carved into them. You're looking at a loom weight with an image stamped into it. The image is probably of the goddess Athena, who is holding her owl on her hand. She is, of course, the patroness of the art of weaving. Volume 3 will be on the palace itself. We hope to have that out by January. It's going to be a detailed description of the buildings of the palace. They're a comparison with the other Macedonian palaces. We're going to do a long section on the art of carving. Since we have eight faces of two capitals now, we can see exactly how the sculptors worked as they went around these capitals. And of course, the Corinthian capital is a very easy dating tool. So this is further evidence we have and why we're calling this the Palace of Philip V. And we'll go through the various parts of the Corinthian order blocks and their dates as well. 
the threshold blocks. We're going to do, do a reconstruction of this odd little doorway. And again, it's peculiar to the 3rd and 2nd century BC. There will be an article on the snake bracelet as well. We have a website, it's on the sheets handed out to you, where you see more than just the palace. Uh, there are a few videos on there. For instance, the, one of our Australian volunteers you see here who is holding what we thought was a hook. Except one of the students did some research on the hook and he makes a very good case that it is actually an antique type of key that was in use. And so we decided to recreate this key and lock mechanism. And there's a small video on how we went about recreating it and how this particular thing worked. We're about to do another recreation, which will be on the website, because for the six years of excavating, we found these things. Now, everybody immediately called them spear points, arrow points, but they really don't look like a good spear point or arrow point. We always refer to them as projectile points, question mark. We never really believed they were projectile points. So the question is, after looking at these, we know what spear points look like. We've dug up a few of them during the course of excavation. But what were these things? We did research at the British Museum, looked through every rusty piece of iron they had in the weapons department, tools department. We couldn't think of anything. And so, rather frustrated, uh, Eula mentioned, well, they're probably double-pointed nails. So what? How would you use a double-pointed nail? And then we Googled double-pointed nail. <laughs> and there are six companies in North America and Europe that make double-pointed nails. And we looked at how they're used. And so we wrote to the president of one of these companies and said, where are some archaeologists who have found these odd little things here? How do you think they could be used? And we made some suggestions to him. This is what we think they were used for. If you ever have built a floor or a deck or a patio, you know there's a problem on the ends of things. And that is with weather, there's a warp of the boards if they're laid down flat. And even if they're nailed in, if the warp is severe enough, it'll pull the nail up out of the board. Now, of course, there's no problem. We have screws. The screw wasn't invented until the 15th century, however. So how else could you lay the floor down? Well, you could lay the boards edgewise. Notch them, put them on the rafters for your second floor or for your floor down below. But then again, you have the problem of just lying loose, they're going to wobble back and forth. So this guy suggested, well, what if you drilled holes through them, put your little thingies like that, and then slam the boards together? You would have a nice, thick, neat beam now, which you could transport, use as a truss in a roof, used as a part of a floor. You might say, well, why not just take the boards and nail them together? Because ancient nails have thick heads to them, which means you're going to have to pound like you've never pounded before, or drill to let the head sink in anyway. So anyhow, we're going to try this. We don't know if it's going to work or not. We just got an email just before the lecture began. Some weapons expert museum in England said this is in, in any fashion a weapon. You can count that out immediately. So you can go to the website now to look at the palace. Uh, hats off to the motley crew that excavated it this past summer. And that is where we have left Bilizora at this point. So I thank you very much and hope you visit the website and take a look. <laughs>